live now. Okay, let me hold on. Let me just get this link real quick. Put it out there. You can change the thumbnail later. <laughs> Sending to Alana. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're set. So what's up everyone? Um, I'm here with Johannes Carlson. Uh, good Twitter, uh, MBTI Twitter. Uh, and also from a whole different country. <laughs> it was so hard like trying to get this whole I don't know, with all the time differences and everything. I think that we have like a six hour difference, right? Yeah. 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 But I wanted to give Johannes the opportunity to introduce himself first before we introduce the topic. Uh, take it away. <laughs> first of all, if I don't respond to a question, um, the screen has been freezing like every now and then when you say something. Mm. So <laughs> if I don't respond, just repeat the question. Um, Introduce myself. Well, I'm Johannes. I I'm studying, not philosophy yet, but I'll get there eventually. Um I'm Swedish, twenty years then I'm not twenty years old, I'm twenty one. Sorry. Um writing about typology a lot on Twitter and my blog, if we could Link that one maybe yeah. afterwards. Um, and I write emails about pretty much what we're going to talk about now uh, mm -hmm. different archetypes, sometimes philosophy. Those are probably my two biggest interests and what I spend the most time on. Yeah. Anything more people should know? Um, you said that you were ENTJ, right? I didn't. I am. Mm -hmm. I'm an ENTJ. Um, I'm a non-stereotypical ENTJ, should be said. Um, uh, using actual, like, union writing and mostly socionics, which is what I prefer in comparison to MTI, I am definitely an ENTJ. Um, there are, I think the most common opinion now is that I'm either an ENTJ or an INTJ, mm -hmm. but in the past, I have had a lot of people <laughs> aggressively <laughs> typing me as an INTP as well. But yeah. definitely an NTJ of some sort. Yeah, I would agree that you're definitely NTJ. Um, whether you are ENTJ or INTJ, personally, I don't know what I would type you as. Um, I would not be surprised if I were to run a profiling session on you and I'd be like, oh, you're INTJ. But at the same time, uh, I also wouldn't be too surprised if it's like, oh no, you actually are ENTJ, um, especially since I don't see you much in person. But regardless, you're definitely NTJ, and I think that's pretty much what most matters. Um, so yeah. anyway, <laughs> yeah, so this is Johannes, and as y'all know, um, he pretty much just introduced himself, and after the live stream, um, we're gonna be providing, and it's gonna hopefully, be in the description towards and everything too um in the comment section we're gonna be providing like his twitter uh we're also gonna be providing like a link that you can go to check out his uh blog site um and you can also subscribe to his emails uh where he talks about a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today and many other things too but i think that yeah, that's the one i would recommend if you want to get into well first of all get into what we're talking about now but also get into my mind because the blog is sort of it's not as fun yeah the emails are where where I have fun and where mm -hmm. I actually express my thoughts yeah and they're fun like they're actually really fun to read um whenever I get behind on them then I have them go to a separate folder that way I'm able to just catch up and binge read on them and I didn't know until recently until recently that you actually allow people to not allow, but you know what I mean. You actually recommend that people email you actually enjoy discussing it and everything. That's really cool. 
Um, so yeah, I think that I'm probably gonna start doing that more often, but that's something to keep in mind uh, that when you do subscribe to his email, he allows people to uh, email back to him. He likes to hear your thoughts. So all of that being said though, um, today <clears throat> we're gonna be talking about the four masculine archetypes, which we're actually about to introduce that now. Um, and I think that this goes hand in hand with the latest video that I put out um, last Sunday, which was apologizing on the behalf of all wicked men, um, or just ignorant men in general. Um, I've been seeing personally that there's been a lot of attacks, a lot of attacks on men as a general collective whole, a lot of attacks on masculinity, um, most of them being rightfully so. But at the same time, uh, masculinity is not in and of itself something that should be abhorred, you know? It's not something in and of itself that should be, you know, beaten and destroyed. And I believe that there is good masculinity out there, um, as I hope that, you know, Johannes does too. And so even though there are bad men out there, there are also good men. And the whole thing pretty much is to teach men how to be better men. Um, and so, I think that going off of that video, if you haven't seen it yet, then uh, you can go check it out if you want to. Uh, that one was more on like other issues such as like sexual assault and you know, just, just a whole bunch of like issues going in that direction um, and how men have like been looked at and abused. I mean, how they have abused their masculinity in that way. And I think in this uh, video, we're gonna be more providing a solution for that or a possible solution. Um, so, there are four masculine archetypes, um, and I just wanted to give a quick intro to what an archetype may be, and like you know what all of that, uh, what all of what we're going to be talking about may be for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with it. And then I'm also going to hand it over to Johannes because I've gotten pretty much all of my information or most of my information besides YouTube videos from a site called The Art of Manliness, um, which actually Johannes presented to me. But Johannes actually read the book. And so I'm gonna be kind of like just giving a few of my notes here and there, uh, but Johannes is gonna be doing most of the teaching. Um, so I'm just gonna go through this uh, intro that I have. Um, and the art of manliness is pretty much the goal was helping men to become better men. Um, to become a complete man, a man must work to develop all four of the archetypes. The result of striving to become complete is a feeling of manly confidence and purpose. Um, Jung actually started this uh, by talking about the personal unconscious, which was created by personal experience, and then the collective unconscious, which was uh, consisted of instinctual and universal thought patterns that humans developed over thousands of years of evolving. He called them archetypes. Um, so uh, this explained why Jung was heavily into esoteric things such as alchemy, astrology, dream interpretation, and tarot not because of the modern reasons such as future telling, but rather believing they were gateways to exploring what was in someone's collective unconscious, even if they were unaware of it. Archetypes aren't personality types, and that's something that we should put out there right away. Um, they are energies or behavior patterns we all have to varying degrees and can develop more of. So that being said, as we are discussing the four uh, masculine archetypes today, um, in actuality, if you can immediately identify with one of them, that actually means that you're not balanced because the goal is to kind of like come to the center of the, the quadrants uh, so that you can like be able to use all of them um, more. So if you can see a lot more with one and not as much of the other ones, and now you can know on the other ones to work on. But it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm a magician and you're not working on becoming like any of the other ones as well. Um, and then the last part of the uh, intro is Robert Moore came along and in his belief, uh, everyone has both feminine and masculine archetypal patterns within them, often referred to as an anima for the feminine and animus for masculine. He believed essentially that toxic masculinity and other horrible displays from men were due to not being as in touch with their animus. Uh, which is the masculine archetype. Western society supposedly suppresses the animus or masculine archetype within them, encouraging men to transition to their anima instead, which is a feminine archetype, which isn't inherently bad, 
good even, because we do need to be in touch with our feminine side to an extent, but not when it's at the expense of the animus. So a man needs to still be in touch with their masculinity to an extent. In fact, to a huge extent. Um, and I guess that's what uh, Robert Moore's like main point is. This is where the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover uh, come in. A man must be in touch with all four of these archetypes, which we're gonna be explaining um, momentarily. Three subtypes lie within each archetype, kind of like health levels. For example, the king can be the tyrant or the weakling or the king in his fullness. Balance in the, so balance in the integrity, in the balance in the integration of the first two will create the latter. So that's my intro. Uh, hopefully uh, that was coherent. And was there anything that you wanted to correct or add, Johannes? Not correct. Um, one thing I thought about when you talked about your recent video about toxic masculinity, mm -hmm. I want to tie that, which we'll get into what it is later, but I want to tie it to the uh, expression of the tyrant, mm -hmm. the... Uh, shadow pole of the king, and the shadow pole of the warrior, which would be the sadist. Nice. Yeah. And I think those two are the external expressions of what we today often see as toxic masculinity. I think that's a great Whereas idea. Whereas if they're fully developed, they won't be, well, if they are developed, they won't be toxic. Mm. Yeah. Um, one thing... I don't know how familiar your viewers are with archetypes. I'm guessing not very. Yeah, I. Considering I don't how think... well known it is no, in the population I don't much about... in general. Um, but one thing that helps me, or helped me, understand what it is is Plato. Mm -hmm. Jung and Plato was. Jung liked Plato a lot. Um, and if we look at the, if we look at nature, there are no true triangles. We can see triangular shapes in different things, but not the actual triangle. Mm -hmm. And that is like, we can see signs of the archetype. We can see results of an archetype, but we can't see the actual archetype. So the archetype is lying in the collective unconscious, like you mentioned, and what we see in practice is copies of it. Mm. Um, like almost shadows of what the perfect archetype would be. Yeah, that checks out for me. Um, it, I think we actually learned about that a lot in a um, uh, class that I was in when we were discussing Plato and how he looks at the material world and then what's actually behind it. Um, and so it kind of goes back to uh, what Jung is even doing in looking at archetypes in this way. Um, and it seems like a very INFJ kind of thing, um, in my opinion, or just NI in general. Um, but definitely like inferior SE. And I think that I'm actually really excited to uh, talk about this because um, like I said, with last week's video and everything, it's really already been on my mind a lot. And I feel like I don't I don't like just presenting problems without presenting potential solutions to them. And so I feel like this would definitely be like a really good solution, a really good perspective to, for people to be able to adopt um, and to look forward into. And I agree with you um, on the tyrant uh, being a reason for a lot of what we see in the toxic masculinity culture um, in a way. In fact, I think that I've had some, I wrote down some comments that I'd like to make um, from fictional characters even that I, I feel like could be tyrants, which by the way, um, <clears throat> it, for those of you who weren't probably like listening or who just logged in, um, each uh, different subtypes within them, which are like pretty much weaker. Um, and the tyrant would be one of the uh, king subtypes of the archetype, so a less healthy king. I'll, but actually, anyway. I'll quickly jump in there. Um, I wouldn't mm. call the tyrant and the weakling subtypes of the king, but rather mm -hmm. shadows of the king. So the king is one gotcha. thing. That was another thing. The, um, 
the two failed kings are shadows of what that king could be. It's it's a failure. It's yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've read I read that too. Uh, both shadow and subtype, but I think that you're right. Uh, shadow would probably be better because what you're really aiming for is the king in its fullness. Um, and so, yeah, and subtypes would be like a misleading uh, form of that. Uh, do you have a specific order that you wanted to go through with this? Um, the natural order for me would be to go King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Okay. Uh, if that's the way it's presented in the book, I mean, well, the way I've learned it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's actually how I wrote down my notes. Um, although from the site, they put it in a different order from uh, how yes. you believe like a man could go. Yeah, and but King, is the, then, you... King is the final archetype. Um, it's the one that combines all of them into... into a sort of... I wouldn't say someone can't be mature if they don't develop the King, but the King is very... It's a core and it's very essential both to our culture and as individuals. Right. So I think that's why they did it last. Yeah, that's what they said too. Um, but even before that, you said that you wanted to go through the boyhood. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you can um, move away from there. The, uh, the four archetypes are the what we should strive towards. But before that, the office talks about the difference between boy psychology and man psychology, where we start with four boy archetypes that later on develop into man archetypes. Those boy archetypes are, they should be, I'm not entirely sure how to describe this so it makes sense. They should be discarded in favor, in favor of the man archetypes, but they should still be kept. Like in some in some instances, in some situations, we should still access the boy archetypes because they are the more life bringing in a sense. Um, mm. They bring more of the enthusiasm in the sense. Um, but yeah, uh, the first boy archetype is the uh, divine child which is the first archetype we go into. Um, the authors bring up Jesus as an example of this, as well as Moses. It's where, essentially where we're helpless and we need someone to, it's a child that is the center of the world he's in, which could be like just center of the family. Mm. Um, that needs protection, that can't be, he can't protect himself, he can't do things by himself, so he needs constant, constant attention and constant protection. Um, this archetype should definitely be kept because it's life-giving. Um, you mentioned that Jung was into dream analysis a lot, mm -hmm. and in the book they bring up a lot of dream, uh, including with the divine child where when a man goes through a change of some sort, it's a major life change, mm -hmm. the uh, symbol of a young child, um, a newborn child, is often brought up as an indicator of change and an indicator of life. So it's definitely something that shouldn't be completely dismissed. Mm -hmm. The is a man archetypes, the boy archetypes had shadows, and the shadows of the divine child is the high chair tyrant, which is essentially a spoiled child. Everything should be theirs. No one should say anything against them. Everything belongs to him. And he doesn't have to do anything. And we know a lot of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can definitely remember quite a few from when I started school. Um, then it's the weakling prince which is the passive pole of the uh, divine child. Uh, the passive, they, they're still the center of their own world, but in a sort of manipulative 
way where they're passive so everyone has to pay attention to them so that they'll do something. Mm. Um, it's a sort of narcissism or hidden narcissism. Um, then this one develops into the king, which they're like the beginning and end of the whole archetype idea. The divine child where we're born and the king, which is the final one. Mm. Mm. But I think I'll go through the all the boy archetypes first and then go into the um, final archetype, so to say. Yeah, sounds good. Um, the uh, next archetype is the pre precious child, which is the child version of the magician. It's, if you can remember or think of a child that always asks why, <clears throat> that's the precious child. They're always asking why, they always want to learn something. Um, I think of uh, Solomon when he asked for wisdom in the Bible. Mm. Um, where God says, okay, what do you want? And he doesn't ask for power and glory or money, but for wisdom. That is the essence of the precious child. Which made him get everything else, and the precious child and the magician isn't just about. It isn't just academia. It isn't just knowledge, but it boils down to everything else in life as well. But it's still the core essence of it. Um, so, just a quick question on that. So, him, so Solomon, King Solomon, asking for wisdom, uh, is not necessarily. Because when you originally said a child that's always asking why, um, I feel like it, it could be branched off into two ways where there's a child that's like genuinely inquiring and then there's a child that's like maybe kind of like stubborn or uh, just wanting to be challenging. And maybe there could be a mixture of both. Um, but would you say that both of these uh, forms would fit that archetype? I'd say the genuinely interesting one would be what the precious child is about. Gotcha. Uh, maybe the challenging one would fit the active shadow of the know it all. Okay. Gotcha. That makes um, sense. Because that is the, one of the shadows of the precious child, which always tries to know everything, always tries to be good, be smart. Um, place jokes in other people. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like they compare it to the trickster archetype as well. Always tricking people, always trying to be the smart one in the room, even though even though they aren't in the first place or it's just bad for the situation or themselves. Mm -hmm. And they have a sort of display of superiority where I'm the smart one. I'm the good one. Rather than trying to learn which the healthy precious child would do. Got you. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. For and that. then the uh, dummy is the other pole of it. And it's not that they're necessarily dumb, but they pretend to be. <laughs> um, they... Uh, yeah, they pretend to be dumb so that people will tell them things so that people will pay attention to them again. <laughs> um, another archetype that isn't too fun to deal with. The um, next one is the Oedipal child, which should not be confused with the Oedipus complex, because it's sort of different things, even though they both stem from the same source in the name of it. Mm. This is the child version of the lover archetype. And it's often seen as the cause of spirituality. Um, and this is where a connection to the feminine, archety ar archetypally feminine, grows 
in the first place. Um, it's not in the healthy archetype. It's not an obsessive relationship to the mother, mm. but rather the, the um, archetypally feminine, the, the feminine that can't be tied to a specific person. Mm. The uh, one of the shadows, though, the mammoth boy, is definitely mm. obsessed with his physical mother, and well, is essentially dependent on her, and creates the whole relationship to the feminine on his own mother, which could be, depending on the mother, essentially, could be disastrous or just bad. Mm. But it's still, it's still bad because it's singular and it's concrete rather than going into feminine as a whole. Mm. Um, the other pole is the dreamer, which doesn't really live. Um, there's no real life force, which will go. I'll go into more when it comes to the lover archetype, but the both the lover archetype and the oidful child is very much about life force and appreciation of life. So the passive pole of the archetype is depressing lifeless, essentially. Now the most interesting child archetype. I have almost I've been planning and almost made a Twitter video on this because it's it's an interesting one. We often see the hero archetype as a final one, a really good one. The archetypal journey of the hero is something we strive towards. But in this book, they suggest that the hero archetype has intense limitations that makes it a uh, almost childish archetype. It develop, oh, we go into this archetype as we grow up, um, around the teenage years, maybe, well, puberty, essentially. Um, and it's, it is a good archetype. It's an energetic one. It's one that okay, we can fight, we can win, and we can win over everything. Um, think of Achilles, mm. like this boyish, almost pride in being able to win. One example they bring up is in Top Gun, the main character, how he is very much of a hero archetype until, I'm allowed to spoil it, um, until his co-pilot dies and he has to go through like personal trouble that makes him develop into the more of the warrior archetype. The hero archetype doesn't know these limits. Mm -hmm. There's no in the traditional medieval story, the hero archetype is the hero that fights a dragon and wins the princess. But there's never a story after that. There's mm. never a story of the hero being married to the princess. Mm. There's never a story of what happens after he wins her, because the hero doesn't have an after he wins her. Huh. The hero is just about winning her. That's where it ends. Whereas the warrior is both, I'll get to that later, but the warrior is both more aware of his own limits and in a greater context than just proving himself. Which is why the hero archetype is great, but it's limited. And living in the hero archetype would burn us out and would be very unhealthy. Got you, got you. And <clears throat> this is why it makes a lot of times for really good movies, which yes. are more of like short lived. And it's instead of like maybe even a lot of TV shows where they may only have like they could have like several seasons and it'll be harder to keep a hero archetype going after the girl i guess yeah. in this case for that long 
Mm. Yeah. Um, is there anything I should clarify on that? Like the boy archetypes in general? Oh, not for me. Yeah, I think that you explained that pretty cohesively. Then we'll go into the archetypes of it's a title title archetypes of mature masculinity. Uh, um, I said I should start with King, right? Yeah, yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, so you've taken notes on this. So, is there any is there anything you want to add or something that sounds weird? Just go ahead. Um. Sure. Um. Yeah. um okay. Well. Then actually, since I have like shorter notes, then I'll throw out <clears throat> probably like what I have here, and okay. then you could just expand on it from there. Is that yeah. cool? okay? Yeah, sure. So the king. We're starting with the king, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the king. Uh, I wrote down the king is known for pretty much governing themselves from a highly evolved self. They're usually calm, understanding, wisdom, and knowledge. Uh, logical well-being, confidence, purpose, and well-being give him a supreme sense of balance, even when the world around him becomes chaotic. Low neuroticism, huh, cool, calm, and collected, acts rather than reacts, surveys, surveys from a broad view, and then takes on, um, takes on and presents an overarching perspective, allowing him to be immovable in face of passing and superficial. He's usually behind the scenes, um, mends broken relationships, keeps his word, acts with honesty, and takes responsibility for his actions. Integrity is huge for someone who's really big on a king archetype. His rules provide structure flourish, um, which is usually coming from the magician's insight. Uh, we'll get into that. He leaves a blessing for others in word of encouragement that can leave others feeling stronger than before because usually king archetypes like they're known for like leaving blessings you know to like their children and all of that but that's you know you don't have to have a child in order to like leave a blessing it can be even in the sense of encouraging somebody else um i often think of like aslan you know like like or that type of like character where it's like uh, you've done a great job, you know, like I'll take it from here or something like just really encouraging in that sense. Um, concerned with legacy, anything such as an idea, business or tradition that lasts even long after gone, but changes other people's lives. Um, so some examples that I uh, have here uh, that you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but they provide insight and action oriented. I think of um, General Iroh. Um, and then T'Challa, I actually think of him as, you know, even though he had like a, maybe like a hero's journey kind of thing, I think he was still also coincidentally using the king archetype, or like you could see a lot of a king archetype in him. Um, Mufasa, in my opinion, and Aslan, I think they both had like, you know, a king archetype. And the king archetype is often like, you know, um, each archetype, Type is trying to like channel or grow or like go to the center and i think that uh from what i've read uh and heard on youtube and everything uh they are often trying to learn to channel the magician which we'll once again talk about later um which is more in like expressing emotion um persuasive speaking and even taking like more acting classes so yeah those are my notes and uh feel free to like go from there <laughs> That's definitely more than I have. <laughs> um, the, uh, I definitely agree with your example. Pachala is a great one. Even awesome. though I agree that he does go on the hero's journey, mm -hmm. he also expresses a lot of the king archetype. Aslan and Mufasa are also great. Mm -hmm. um, no, not Aslan, Mufasa. Wait. <laughs> yes, Aslan. Sorry, mixing that <laughs> up. Um, I'd also say Captain America is a pretty good one hmm. in how he how he stabilizes and leads the Avengers. Oh, I see that. I um, see that. That makes sense. Whereas, I don't know if I can find a clear lever archetype in it, but I can definitely find magicians and warriors. We could get to that when we go to those archetypes. Um, 
the first thing I wrote down on it is that it's a sort of father energy. Um, it's it's sort of like it's centering and it's I honestly don't know what to add after when you talk about it. It you included most most of it, but it's centering and it's stabilizing and it's sort of like a good example and a good manifestation of patriarchy mm. where he takes care of people that belongs to his tribe mm. it doesn't the, a good symbol for the king archetype is medieval kings mm. but it doesn't have to be a king in the sense that you you're actually a king of a kingdom because then obviously almost none of us would actually reach the king archetype considering that like seven countries with kings in the world but it's both in part that they take care of their kingdom that's the first and foremost responsibility um in the crown the uh, series they mm -hmm. talk about this where the task of royalty isn't to be normal people it's to be examples and it's to be almost characters of virtue that people should look, look up to um and that's that's essentially how i see a king not a king not a king in his own personality but a king in what he takes on himself what responsibility he takes mm, got you um from what i was reading too i i uh read that they tend to be like the center um, yeah. of everything, which makes sense, you know, because the king is like usually at the top or and all of that. Um, and then especially like going with, I'm pretty sure you're going to get into the, uh, the shadows of the king. Um, but I'm at uh, a lot of the shadows of the king can often uh, be represented in a, uh, I guess, what would the word be? Um, well, talking about that center, it, when a king is in its fullness, if I understand correctly, then they naturally are just in the center because of their coolness, their low neuroticism, their, able, their ability to be able to just be studying everything. But then when a king is like falling into their um, shadows, then they can probably become like self-seeking and they can put themselves in the center uh in a way to seek attention in a way so and i feel like once again like we see a lot of this um everywhere they become like power hungry uh like the tyrant or they become a weakling which uh coincidentally we were talking about um t'challa uh and i personally saw <laughs> i remember first watching the movie and i was talking to jamila about it and i said like yeah i kind of saw t'challa as like weak and um and i know that some of my friends are like what? And I was like, no, I don't know. I just, I just kind of did. And I didn't know why until I rewatched the movie again. And in my opinion, it looks like T'Challa was uh, the weakling um, and uh, Killmonger was the tyrant. But then it was also interesting to read from what I've saw that the tyrant and the weakling are always going like hand in hand, like behind like if you search in, underneath every weakling, there's a tyrant who's like pretty much afraid to like lose its power and like about to lash out at any moment, which T'Challa kind of was like nervous of people like overpowering him or like questioning his authority. And, you know, once again, we're about to get into that, but like, you know, he was afraid and he, he kept on like going back to his father, you know, like I was like, dude, this guy cannot really lead. <laughs> like he just keeps on crying and like going back to his dad for like help and everything. Um, but then Killmonger was so much of a tyrant that he wasn't being able to be centered, uh, which is interesting because he was driven so much to get to where he was. And now it's like, after he got there, then he didn't really know how to handle all of that power. Um, so yeah, I think that um, th those are some of the th thoughts that I had in past. Um, but 
did you want to start explaining what the tyrant and the weakling uh, shadows are of the king? Yeah, sure. Um, that's a great analysis. I actually thought of Killmonger as the uh, a good example of the tyrant. Mm. But I did know the stat about T'Challa. Mm. Actually, uh, I like that one. Nice. <laughs> the uh, shadows. Well, you essentially explained them, but the shadows are the tyrant and the weakling. The tyrant is the uh, kind of person that needs power, mm. he needs to have people around him that do what he says. Um, I think a good example of this is, now I go back, way back in memory from stuff I read as a kid, but Richard Lionheart and Prince John, where Richard Lionheart is the actual king, and Prince John, when he takes over, is the tyrant. Because, mm. well, he is, the country really doesn't go well when he's the standing king and people rebel, but then Lionheart comes back and fixes everything. Sort of mm. very simplistic of the story, but it covers the essentials of it. Um, Weakling is someone who wants to be a king, but doesn't have the courage or the stability or the influence to be a king. Mm. So, he's a weakling instead. Um, another thing I thought of when I took notes of it was the movie Greyheart, mm. where I can really see all of the three kings, or the king and his two shadows. Because William Wallace is definitely a king, if not a name. Um, in the way he gathers people around him, his stability in the four battles. But, and the tyrant is the English king. His name I can't remember. Um, whereas the weakling is the uh, Scottish heir to the throne, but not king since Scotland was under England. Um, he's definitely the weakling that goes into the uh, fullness of the king archetype in the end of the movie, and that's that's. I think one of the, my favorite parts where the weakling, someone who's been the weakling the whole movie, goes into becoming a full king and taking responsibility for himself, but also for his entire country. And I think that's what I really enjoyed about um, Black Panther too. That um, at the end you see. T'Challa become like at the end, like even though I thought that he was like weak, like before and everything, at the end you see him become like, okay, you are now a true king. Like even when he was yeah. in the uh, ancestral plane, he was talking to his father and everything. And then his father was like, why are you like, why are you kneeling down? Stand up, you are a king now. Like he had to keep on being reminded of his, of his archetype, of his position. Um, because in my opinion, he was a weakling, which I didn't know about these archetypes back when I first watched it, but it's interesting that that's exactly what I called him. And then I called Killmonger a tyrant. So this, this goes to show that these archetypes really are there. And that Killmonger, once again, like we we're talking about toxic masculinity, um, Killmonger is a good example of that in my opinion. Like he was misogynistic, uh, in the way that he treated the woman there while, um, even T'Challa as a weakling, um, he wasn't really, he, was, he wasn't treating them that way. In fact, if anything, he was allowing them to make most of the decisions. Um, and he was just kind of like going along with it. But then when he became like the fullness of the king, then he still heeded to, you know, like what the woman were probably saying, um, instead of just dismissing Nakia and stuff like that, while also um, continuing to lead effectively. And I think that that's what every man um, should be, you know, moving toward uh, or trying to like learn to channel and uh, and grow. But remember that we're trying to like 
we're not trying to embody one archetype. This is just one of the four. We're trying to move, we're trying to embody like all four of them uh, so that we can become well-rounded and move into the center of that um, piece. Because the more that you channel the king, the less you'll be channeling the magician from what I hear. And the more that you're channeling the warrior, then the less you'll be channeling the lover. Uh, and so, yeah. I'm not sure I agree with that one, actually. Um, I think there are several examples of people that personify the, both the king archetype and the magician archetype. Mm -hmm. And the um, lover and warrior as well, even though they might be counterintuitive. I... Um, From what I was reading, then yep. they were saying that, um, well, actually, no, this one was from a YouTube video, so it could be right, but it was making sense from what a person was saying um, that each of them kind of like, like you said, they counter, they're counterintuitive. And I think that it's more so that if you are just, yeah, kind of like what I was saying, like if you're too much of the king, like you can embody both of them, that's where like the balance comes in. But if you're like too much of the king, if you're too focused on, you know, um, the aspects of what the king may have, and you then you may not really be using as much of what the magician may be providing. Um, and so that's why, like, just like everything that's supposed to be like balance presented. But I could be wrong. Um, I actually trust your judgment, especially since you actually like read the book and everything. So yeah. Um, and we haven't even talked about the magician yet, so maybe. I think that makes sense. Like, um, if you focus fully on one, it could counter out the other one. But the ideal should be to personify both of them mm. or express both of them. Yeah. Um, again, Solomon uh, with the king and magician. Mm. This magician is to tease on that one, we'll go through the warrior first, but the magician is about wisdom. Mm. And, well, that's what he was about. But you mentioned Killmonger, and I think Killmonger is also a good example of uh, Shadow Warrior. Mm. Um, mm. So he's not just a Shadow King, but he's also a Shadow Warrior, which makes it even worse. Gotcha. T'Challa, in the end at least, is both a full king and a full warrior. Mm. That makes um, sense. But because in the, that case, uh, yep. uh, yeah, I was going to, uh, in that case, I can uh, go over the notes that I have for the warrior. Uh, so the warrior, I put usually aggressive, masculine, and overall powerful. Um, they focus on logic and they very confident. Um, they're driven and goal oriented at its best, what it's fighting for, what they're fighting for, and is more contemplated. Kind of like channeling the anger properly rather than allowing it to explode recklessly. At worst, can be either reckless and short-sighted or even passive aggressive. The typical nice guy, too polite to go after what he wants. Alert and vigilant. Carpe diem, not afraid to die and lives life as if every minute is his last. Studies the weaknesses of opponents and strikes them there. Intelligent and clever in such a way. Spends so much time considering the contingencies that when crisis arrives is able, that when crisis arrives, they're able to be instinctively decisive. Emotionally detaches from both emotions and human relationships enough so he may have room to pretty much swing his sword. The archetype of destruction, but only to make room for something new, fresh and more alive, receives orders from a uh, magician, essentially. And some examples that were presented uh, were Michael Jordan and Hillary Clinton, kind of like this narrow go after what you want kind of thing. Um, and uh, the growth path, once again, would be kind of like learning to express like more care and affection. Uh, so I think that uh, that would be more of like channeling the lover, which we'll get to later. But yeah. 
Yeah, so that's what we have. The authors note that the lever is essential for the warrior to work in a good way. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there will be a lack of compassion, which, with the destruction of the warrior or the tendency of destruction from the warrior, is a bad combination mm -hmm. and will result in the uh, status, which is the active shadow of the warrior. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned destruction, and I put down in my notes destruction, but towards what should be destroyed. It's mm. righteous destruction. It's not just, I want to destroy something, but it's the ability to destroy something that should be destroyed. And I like that. They're also very much about commitment and loyalty to something greater than themselves, mm. which is one of the major differences between the warrior and the hero. The hero is just there for its own sake, for glory. Uh, think of Achilles. Um, goes into the uh, Trojan War, not because he has to, not because he, his king asks him, but because he wants glory for himself. Mm. Whereas the warrior goes in because that's his duty. Um, not just that the warrior is blindly following orders, but the warrior is fighting for something higher than himself. Um, again, if I bring up Braveheart, uh, Wallace is a great example of a warrior. He's not fighting for himself. He's not even fighting for revenge, but he's fighting for freedom for his people. Mm -hmm. That's the ideal that he fights for. Um, in Gladiator, the uh, Maximus, I think his name is. I haven't seen it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I still I, need to. Then I won't spoil too much. You should watch it. Um, <laughs> He's not just fighting for gold, but he's fighting to avenge his dead family. Mm. Uh, so it's not just, I want to fight for my own sake, but it's, right. it's fighting for a cause higher than himself. So with Killmonger, which you said he became like a shadow warrior, uh, uh, because he started kind of like that, like he was trying to fight for his own family in a way, like to avenge his father. Um, but I guess where would you say that he started to become like more in his shadow? Was it like when he finally arrived at position of king and then he didn't know how to control it? I think it was definitely before that. Got you. Um, I don't remember the specifics of the movie, to be honest. So I couldn't say specifically, um, but I could go through the shadows and you could take that analysis. Yeah, I yeah. My Panther is more in your active memory for me as mine. Although I do love the movie. Um, the uh, shadows of the warrior is the sadist and the masochist. The sadist is Darth Vader, essentially. Um, someone that despises weakness in everyone else. Someone that fights for the sake of fighting. Mm. Um, it's not for a greater cause. It's because, well, fighting is fun. Almost like Ares in Greek mythology. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, very much, very much a hatred for weakness both in himself and in other people. While at the same time, it's it can often be a mask weakness. Like, if I feel weak, what I have to do is to repress that weakness and express nothing but strength. That would also be full of the disabled. Mm. Um, the masochist is... Someone that doesn't take action. Someone that can't really do anything. Uh, if the warrior is action, the um, shadow of it, the passive shadow is inaction. It's a feeling of powerlessness. Um, mm. Easily takes abuse if someone tries to abuse him. He can't stand up for himself and he can't stand up for anyone else. 
which the warrior does. That adds up. So where would you put, or where would you put the translation of kill mother? I think the sadist for sure, because um, or wait, so the or the the mass the the one that uh, believes that they want to like pretty much embrace their pain in a way. Um, just like in the same way, like where he wanted to have everyone, um, uh, everybody else suffer pretty much like what he was suffering. Um, and so that's why he wanted to take over Wakanda. So I think that you are right, that it was pretty much never well placed. Like he wasn't actually, he was, part of him was trying to avenge his father, but it was, it was just taken completely out of control. Um, and he was trying to like take it so much further. He had like pretty much no good intentions. Like he was he was destroying people on his own team um, to get up there. And so I feel like yeah, there was never really like a healthy way that he was displaying an archetype even from the beginning. Yeah. Um, is there anything more we need to add about the warrior? Anything that's unclear about it? Um, no, not from my end. Yeah, I don't have anything. Then we'll go to my favorite. Cool. Mm -hmm. Magician. I think that one's my favorite too. Interesting. Yeah, I think we both were both pretty confident in that one. <laughs> and like easily leans into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the magician uses insight and humor to arrive at solutions rather than force, confident and emotion, fascinated with knowledge to manipulate tools in order to control certain elements and produce desired outcomes. Wealthy in knowledge, the average man does not have access to, an ability to do things that others may not have the knowledge to do. Severely introspective, granting the ability to have foresight into upcoming events and envisioning all possible moves, predict predicting with good accuracy where moves will lead. They can be reticent with knowledge they share, understanding that to be a great teacher, one must understand that knowledge and truth must be taught precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Each concept builds on another. And until a person is proven they are an earnest student worthy of the knowledge he slash she seeks, the magician withholds information. I so heavily relate to that one. <laughs> an alchemist turning baser elements into gold that looks for ways to turn disappointing situations and setbacks into opportunities to grow and learn, to become a better man. Mature magicians, despite the old saying of never telling their tricks, are eager to teach the knowledge they acquire. In fact, because they don't, because they don't, men today suffer. Uncles, fathers, and grandfathers fail to apprentice and teach the younger men living with them. So, some examples of magicians can be artists and actors, such as like Michael Jackson. I mean, sorry, yeah, Michael Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., Ted Cruz, and Bill Clinton. Um, commit to lifelong learning. Um, so, some ways that you could like channel the magician is to commit to lifelong learning meditate slash reflect often, um, create more, consume less, work with your hands, find a mentor and become a mentor and also take a part in the rite of passage. Um, and their channel uh, or growth path is to channel the king, um, learning not to be so driven by emotions as much. So that's kind of like their way to like get into the center. If we're seeing like from what I've read and heard uh, if you're seeing too much magician energy in you, then you need to become like more centered and a little bit more logical um, uh, and not as emotionally driven um, like the king. I would pull down the emotional aspect, or oh, not take it down. I would add something to the side of the emotional part because i don't think magician is in itself or has to be 
especially emotional, but there's def definitely an aspect of it. Um, yeah, sure, go the, ahead. <laughs> the, uh, there can be two different types of magicians, mm. or two different types of knowledge that the magician focuses on. There is spiritual knowledge and technological knowledge. Mm. Both of them being very much under the magician, but not in the same area of influence. Mm. So take IP or coding. That's very much a magician thing. But it's not, it's very different from, say, a prophet from the Bible, which would also be magician. Mm. Um, the name magician is. As far as I know, from two different things. Partly from the like current idea of a magician that plays tricks, which, like you said, they don't share the tricks, but the magician willingly does if if someone is willing and has the ability to learn it. Mm. But the concept of a magician also comes from ancient tribes. Where there is a person that has a connection to the otherworldly, that has a connection not to the material, but to, uh, depending on culture, a connection to nature, a connection to God. Um, the prophets of the Old Testament, for example, or the medicine men in uh, Native America. They're both very much the uh, magician archetype is we have knowledge that most people doesn't have. Mm. It's wisdom and it's tapped into the they're tapping into a pool of knowledge that isn't accessible from the in the material sense. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's very much about secret knowledge. They do what they do for other people. God. It's not, it's not like, if you think of an unhealthy Enneagram 5, they mm. seek, I am Enneagram 5, by the way, I'm speaking to myself now. Um, they often seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge. Or seek knowledge to, I want to know as much as possible. I feel safe if I know something. That's not a magician. The magician knows things, understands things for the sake of teaching it, for the sake of using it in service of other people. That's the healthy magician. Um, the, um, what's the name? Manipulator is the active shadow of the magician. He doesn't do it for other people. He doesn't guide people, uh, but plays with, like, has people in public strings. Uses knowledge he has about people, about concepts, to control people, to mm -hmm. make them do what he wants them to do. Very egoistic and misusing knowledge. Yeah, I see a lot of those characters um, on TV a lot. Um, not the best. <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, the other shadow of it is the naive one or the innocent one. They want the good stuff of the magician. They want the influence. They want the. They want to guide people. They want to be looked up to and asked for advice. But they don't want to do the work. Hmm. They they just want the superficial attention that the magician gets. Got you. But they don't care about actually guiding them. They don't care about actually understanding something and teaching someone. So it's attention seeking on the base of the magician. I want to add your examples. Yes. Yeah, sure. They covered more of the. Yeah, I'm trying to find out examples I want to add. Um, because the examples you brought up was 
very much in entertainment, I think. Um, which the magician can do. Like I said, the magician is also the magician magician that plays tricks, but mm. it's also the spiritual guide. It's also the um, inventor of, I don't know, Tesla cars. Um, so anything that has to do with knowledge that isn't widely accepted. I'd say Plato is a great example of a magician. Jung is another great example. Um, so it can be it can be that entertaining one, but it's also the or I think you mentioned Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, like uh, influential with words. Um, right. Good at expressing things so that people can understand it. But it's also yeah. the philosopher, the teacher, the um, psychologist trying to understand cultures. And yeah. I think we have to keep them in mind so we're not limiting it to just entertainment. Yeah, uh, from what I read, uh, they were saying things such as like, um, well, actually, this wasn't from the reading. This is from also a YouTube video. Uh, they were talking about how the king when the king is uh, trying to go toward the center. And usually that's them trying to manifest more of the magician. Um, and they suggested that if you're having a little bit too much king energy, then you should go into acting. Um, and you should go into like finding a way to be more expressive uh, with your uh, persuasion or something like that. Um, and so I think that's kind of like what uh, I was pretty much going for. Yeah, they said that the king, uh, like learning to so channel the magician by learning to express emotion, persuasive speaking, take some acting classes. Um, and I guess that's what they were talking about. Like, so the actors and artists, such as like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Michael Jackson, even though Michael Jackson maybe was like an entertainer, um, from what you're saying, he possibly was also um, a magician as in, um, because he was using music as his influence to be able to change the world and be able to be able to like uh, progressively push ideas, pretty much in the same way that Martin Luther King Jr. was, only just a different medium. Um, and so I think that that's one way that maybe the magician may be manifested. It's not necessarily that it's definitely like having to be like in entertainment for entertainment's sake. Um, but more so, like, what type of ideologies are you putting in your entertainment to be able to help progress things forward um, in a way? The things that you've accumulated are using it to now help people, just like you were saying, like, you're taking all of this information. What are you going to do? Are you going to use it to help people? Or are you going to, like, hoard it um, in a way to manipulate people, you know? And so, yeah, that's how I was understanding it. Yeah, I'm not... I'm definitely not saying that entertainment isn't a part of the magician. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, take my Jackson, for example. I can definitely see that um, he would tap into the magician because he has knowledge of how music works, knowledge of how to do music, um, an understanding of music that people in general doesn't have. And that I would tie to the magician as well. Mm -hmm. um, while the magician can also be someone that isn't necessarily entertaining, but, but focuses on explaining and educating things. Well, not educating things, educating people about things. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and I think like after we go over the last one, so be prepared for this, I was gonna ask you um, which ones or like how do you see them being manifested um in you or how do you see each of the four being channeled in you um and then maybe maybe even like in myself because you're more familiar with them than i am um and so and you you kind of like see me like on twitter on youtube uh stuff like that so i would like to hear your input on that as well so yeah just be thinking about that um and then we end off with kind of like a final note on like just going over the four really briefly on how knowing about this information can be helpful um, in becoming better examples of men in our society today. So 
just some things to keep in mind uh, on how that'll go before we end the broadcast. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, let's go through your notes and you love our attack and I can think about your questions. Sure. All right. And the final archetype is the lover. Um, what I wrote down is oriented toward deep emotions and connection it is actually usually the first level of what men go to. Um, they're and the lover archetype is emotional and they're focused on well-being. They're very sensual, uh, attuned to mysterious forces and underlying uh, attuned to mysterious forces underlying our everyday in search of exciting endeavors, intense romantic and sexual relationships filled with youthful idealism. They tap into hunches, insights, and premonitions. They read people, social cues, understanding, and are very empathetic, able to connect with a wide variety of people. Provides fuel for the other three types, while in turn, they provide, the other three types provide um, healthy direction and boundary toward worthy goals because apparently the lover archetype from what I was reading um, has like lack of boundary and it's just like very like or something like that. Um, it's also, so according to what I was reading, the most suppressed in men today, um, which is why it's like the first level, but then all of a sudden it's kind of, no, 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 we shouldn't channel that. Um, some examples of the lover archetype are a lot of writers and poets and stylists. Um, to grow, one can begin to enjoy and indulge in what they currently have rather than seek more of it. Um, and their growth channel, uh, so that's that's how to channel more of the archetype, like to begin to enjoy and indulge like what you have right now. Because from what I was hearing and reading, like the lover archetype is pretty much just someone who is very like present and very kind of like, takes in the moment and is just in awe of the wonders of everyday life. Like what most people may see as mundane, the lover archetype like sees is like magical and like receives insight from things that are like, dang, you know, I just look at that as like very plainly while the lover archetype is seeing it from like, maybe even like a rose colored lens, you know, I don't know, but then they're using it to provide insight. Um, and then to take a and their growth channel um, to get to the center would be to become more of a warrior um, by taking action and to be more targeted with their energy um, rather than just allowing it to be like all over the pace, boundless and free. So yeah, that's my notes on that. Yeah, I think the, um, especially this one would be uh, a contrast to warrior archetype is really good. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely how to grow into a more, I think you said targeted? Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's a problem the level of type can easily have. Um, the first thing I wrote down, and I, I will have to clarify this, but the first thing I wrote down on level of archetype is libido. Mm. And I'll have to clarify this one, because when I speak about libido, I use the Jungian definition of it and not the Freudian one. <laughs> yeah, I figured. So <laughs> when Freud talks about libido, um, you might have to help me on the definition here, but I think he talks about sexual energy and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, like sexual energy, sexual drive. Um, Jung includes that, but it's more of life energy. Mm. So the libido is the life energy that someone has and how to direct that. Mm. Um, so the lover is the, he's all about the life energy. It can be sexual, like I think you mentioned intense sexual and romantic relationships. That's right. definitely part of the lover, but it's also an intense relationship with meaning an intense relationship with the beauty of things. Mm. Mm. I think one good example of the lover archetype, or a good way to explain the lover archetype, is to think of, and I'll go back to it, but Plato's ladder of love. <laughs> so the first step is 
to be in love with a physical body. Like, yeah, that one looks good. That's the first step. The next step is to realize, wow, there are actually several people that I find attractive. Mm. So it's a generalized love of the body. Right. That's the second step. And the third step is, but I like this person's mind. I like how they think. And then you generalize that. And then I don't remember the exact order, but he goes into a lot for math. He mm. was a mathematician. He was obsessed with math. Um, and a love for the system they're in, a love for wisdom, and then at the very top, it's a love for, I think it's a love for the form of good. So it's a love for good itself, it's a love for beauty itself. Mm -hmm. That is what the lover archetype in its fullness is about. So, I think the lover archetype, when we hear the word, we can easily think of someone who's obsessed with sex or always looking into a magical relationship. But that is not all of what the lover archetype is. And I wouldn't even say that that's the defining characteristic of the lover archetype. Although it is one and shouldn't be forgotten. Um, Creativity and I wrote down poetry is a great expression of the lover archetype where it tries to find meaning and tries to find beauty in things around them, in nature, in words. It tries to put things through a more almost rose colored lens. Mm. Um, the uh, two shadows of the lover archetype is first the addict, which is the active shadow. And that one definitely asks, why do we have limits on things? If I can find beauty in something, if I can get dopamine from something, why not do it fully? Why limit myself? Mm -hmm. So, and as with lovers, the first, first thing that comes to mind to me is a sex addict, but it's not just that, it's someone that's addicted to food, someone that's addicted to... Now the only thing that, that comes up in my mind is poetry, so I guess someone who's addicted to re reading or writing poetry, but that's, that might not be the most common addiction. Um, but someone who's addicted to finding pleasure, someone who's... And not just because the lover finds pleasure in things, but isn't addicted to it. Um, and the opposite pole of addiction is the impotent, impotent lover. That's how you pronounce it? Yeah, impotent. Yeah, yeah. impotent. Good. Um, they have a lack of meaning in things. Uh, if you remember the oidable child that where we connect to spirituality, it's where we connect to finding meaning in something. So the lover archetype or the passive pole of it lacks meaning, uh, often goes into depression. I think they even talk about clinical depression as a result of the lover archetype going into its shadow. Um, I think you mentioned poet as a good example of the lover archetype, and I definitely agree with that. Uh, I would put King David from the Bible as a good example of the oh, lover yeah. and the king archetype. Yeah, that's good. In a combination between the two. Mm. I don't know if I have any other like great examples light of my mind. But I think that's what I have on the lover archetype. Yeah. Um, I don't even know if I, I don't think I wrote down any um, myself, um, but I'm sure that there's like a lot that I was able, that I'd be able to think of. Like, <clears throat> I feel like uh, <laughs> uh, Anne, Annie, or Anne with an E, 
don't know how familiar you are with her, but she's like someone who I think of as a lover archetype. Like she just, she just really finds like the beauty and like just everything. Um, and wow, all of pretty much like every ENFP <laughs> that I'm thinking about. <laughs> um uh because they see what is like right now but then they take away the the potential from that like they they take from the potential like oh like what could be more from that um so like a lot of like nfps um because i'm thinking of leslie burke as well from bridge to terabithia um and she, she created a whole world out of just the woods and it was able to become like an escape um and she's an ENFP, and then I'm thinking of Tommy Pickles <laughs> from the Rugrats, who is INFP in my opinion. And he also did the same thing. Like he, they were just babies that were chilling, you know, and just, but he somehow managed to like make an adventure out of every situation um, and just bring like magic and like life to it and like seeing all of that, which um, then, you know, you could think about like, oh, well then, you just said magic. Does that mean like magician? But in my opinion, like there's there's still a distinction there because like seeing the magic in the world um, is different from like using information and your knowledge to be able to like you know like the magician uses like information and knowledge in a magical way. So while the lover sees the magic in the world and kind of like embraces it, even while other people may not be able to see it. Um, that's at least how I'm seeing it right now. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong or add on. No, to I agree. Uh, I think the lover sees the magic while the magician uses the magic, maybe. Like, actually practicing the magic. Not literally, but. Yeah, yeah. As a symbol. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that that's. So, those of you who are watching post live stream and everything, uh, that's the four masculine archetypes. Um, and for those of you who may be watching, like, okay, so I just sat through this whole stream, like, how is this helpful? Um, how can we use this? Like, what is this information? Like, how can we make it like actionable or anything like that? Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Johannes? I have a couple of thoughts and the authors of the book has a couple of thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the ideas they have on how to use it, which I'm not a big fan of, is where they almost describe praying to the archetype. Mm. <laughs> like, okay, here's an archetype, so I prayed to the archetype that it will help me take more action, that it will help me make wiser decisions. I see. <laughs> um, and that I'm not a big fan of. Although I can see how like mentally it would help, but it's it's a bit close to praying for me. Um, but they also describe how well. First of all, find like some sort of mentorship. I think you mentioned this on the magician, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some sort of mentorship with people, official mentorship or not, doesn't matter. But with people that has develop more of the archetype, spend time with or learn from, whether you can meet them in reality or read Marcus Aurelius, it doesn't really matter, but spend time with the thoughts and with the mind of people that have developed the archetype. Mm -hmm. so you can see how it looks in real life. Um, I think that would be actually the best way of developing them. Mm -hmm. And then keeping in mind that it's not a not giving up and like you should strive to fulfill those roles, not thinking that, oh, but I'm not a warrior. Well, maybe you aren't a warrior, but it's it's an archetypal role rather than a personality, and that should be kept in mind. Yeah, I think they also mention fake it till you make it. Like, okay, I'm not a king. How do I become more of a king? I fake being a king until I feel like a king. Right. So sort of self fulfilling prophecy in a sense. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I'm also <laughs> clearly like I wouldn't be a fan of 
praying to the archetypes um, either. Uh, I feel like that would, personally speaking, like manifest <laughs> some things that you actually don't want in the spiritual realm. Uh, but um, if you are just thinking of their traits and kind of like being aware of their traits and their behavior, like seeing, like going back over, like hopefully you were taking notes, you know, as we were like discussing these types and everything um, for y'all watching um, and being aware of like how all four of these archetypes create a fully whole masculine, properly masculine man. And, and being aware of that is um, helpful because then you kind of like know like what things to like strive for, what things to pretty much um, try to uh, develop within yourself and to become better at. Um, and if you are unable to do that, well then that, that's that's usually um, the problem. You know, that's that's where uh, a lot of the problems today that we see, like we, we know a lot of um, tyrants and not enough kings in their fullness. Uh, we know a lot of manipulators and not enough magicians in their fullness, you know? And so show, like being able to identify where these archetypes, energies, whatever you want to call it, behaviors are showing up in different people and then being able to identify that in yourself and then shaving away the bad and moving toward the good. Um, finding like healthy ways for all of these archetypes that like, manifest like, within you, all of these behaviors to manifest within you um, as a male. Um, I think that if we're all working on doing that, if we're all working on raising our children, our sons, and um, helping our brothers, you know, whatever, to become more like this, then a lot of the problems that I mentioned in my video um, would kind of, you can never really completely eradicate them, but I feel like they would decrease at least. Um, and so that's just, these are just some thoughts and definitely leaving it up to you guys also to present whatever you guys think about these thoughts as well. Um, and, you know, this is just one system, just one tool um, for you guys to be able to like look at and discuss amongst yourselves. Um, but yeah, in addition to that, um, I was interested once again to know, uh, lastly, like how you relate to the four on a personal level, Johannes. Um, and then if you happen to identify like how I may relate to the four and even some things maybe uh, as like a personal development coach, I'm always trying to like, become better myself. Like what things that you may not have uh, seen much of in me that you think could be working toward, uh, that could be working toward, I won't wouldn't, I wouldn't be offended um, if you notice them, but yeah. Um... Looking at myself, the uh, magician is definitely the one I see the most clearly. Um, which is sort of why I reacted to the description of the emotional magician. Mm. In fact, I think will relate to. While I definitely relate to the part where the magician focuses on getting knowledge and spreading knowledge. Mm. Um, the focus on wisdom and understanding of things. That's the the magician is essentially what I want to be doing with my life. While I don't feel really relate to the fluffy emotional part that I sort of got the vibe from when you described the magician at first. Um, yeah, they they were so, pretty. <laughs> something about that like when from what i was reading so i was even surprised right. that myself because i don't i personally don't consider myself emotional at least not in the aspect that a lot of people would use the word emotional like i don't cry often and i'm not very i'm expressive and you know i'm empathetic but i'm not like emotional like you know so yeah that was also something that i was looking at so the like a drier version of the magician essentially um, is what I have the easiest time seeing in myself. Um, I don't see much of the warrior. Hmm. And that is one I wish I could have more of. Um, like taking action without the, almost leaving the magician behind would be nice. Like taking action without always having everything in my mind. 
mm. would be a good thing at times. Um, one thing I actually do like though, uh, this could be brought up in how to develop the archetype. Um, I started playing rugby 10 months ago. And that is, that's one instance where I definitely feel the warrior archetype. <laughs> Partly in practice, but definitely when I go onto a game and people are there to tackle me in full speed. That definitely brings up the warrior archetype. And it's not an archetype that I'm in a lot, but it, when it comes out like that, it's, it feels great. Because that's when your true ENTJ-ness comes up. <laughs> no, that's where the stereotype of the ENTJ that isn't true comes out. <laughs> let him know, let him know. <laughs> um, then the king archetype is one, I think you actually said that you saw that one in me at some yeah. point. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily one that I see a lot of myself. Hmm. I, I do think that it's there, but not that it's a shadow one, but it, that it's underdeveloped. That it's or underdeveloped, I'm 21, uh, <laughs> that it's not developed enough, that it could still and are still being developed. Got you. But it's definitely the one that I aspire to be the most, in addition to the magician, but the magician is more natural to me. Got you. Got you. That's what I think the magician to me is, or how I work in the magician is, uh, combination between my NI and my 514 Enneagram. Mm, that makes That's sense. Like capturing the core of how I work in magician. Now, someone that is, say, an ESTJ with Enneagram 3 will still be able to go into the magician, but the magician will have different flavors based on their personality. Mm. So their type of the magician might I don't want to take a too stereotypical example so people don't think that, okay, I'm this type, so my magician will look like this. Right. It's not that static, but they might be more likely to have a more technical view of the magician, mm. a more technical expression of it. Um, yes, the lover architect. I don't know about myself, honestly. Um, okay. <laughs> I see it in part in myself, but at the same time, I see myself repressing it a bit too much. <laughs> um, I did describe it on Twitter as hidden at some point. As what? Like hidden. Oh, hidden. Like the archetype's there, but I hide it from people in general. Then someone told me that I don't hide it and it's obvious, so... <laughs> I'm not sure how to, I'm not sure how to see myself in that one. Um, it's definitely one that I have to go into more and I have been going into more a lot in the latest year. I see. Mm. Yeah, I, well, uh, first from what I saw in you, um, yeah, I saw mostly uh, Magician and King. Um, and then I thought I had like my opinion. I thought that like we kind of like both were having like magician king. But then where we were different was that um, there was uh, you had a lot more warrior than I did. That was just for whatever reason, like my thoughts. Maybe also because I had the ENTJ trope on it. Like I just see TE is like you can't have TE without like warrior there. Like that's just how I saw it. And then I'm just like so averse <laughs> to warrior, especially like not only being like, um, well, I won't say not FE because we know like certain like FE users who could actually like, you know, even though they're females, you know, they could be seen as warriors um, in a way uh, with that, that in their um, animus. Uh, but I, I think it's mainly my Enneagram nine possibly <laughs> that's like, you know, like I am, driven and everything but just like what you were saying like with rugby and everything like when i played football 
um, people loved having me on their team because <laughs> it's bad, but I guess it's good too, it worked for them. I was so afraid of being tackled that I, I hate the aggressiveness of the sport. And I was so afraid of being tackled that almost nobody could catch me because I was yeah. just that petrified by it. Um, but it was it was bad whenever I would actually get caught because I, I don't know, I was just really afraid of that. And just, just the aggressiveness and just the assertiveness and that way and competitiveness, like I run away from it. <laughs> like I was on the basketball team and I quit the basketball team because I was always like, well, you know, guys, like every time we lost, everybody else was crying. I was literally the only guy that was like, not like, <gasps> you know, like I was, you know, chilling, like, well, I mean, you know, like, dang, like we, we almost had it. And it's not that I didn't want us to win. I did want us to win, but like, I just kind of take a positive refrain, like, well, at least we had fun guys. And they didn't like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just kind of like, okay, you know, and then when I play basketball to my friends, I have a friend who's INFP and he'll he'll be like, you know, like we're just all having fun and I'm I'll be on his team and then, you know, when the other team is like winning a little bit, he's like, Okay, now I'm getting mad. And I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> like it's all right, dude. Like it's it's just just a game, you know. But uh yeah, so I feel like that's a lot more like warrior archetype and I guess I don't have like enough of that. Um like I even related a little bit when they were talking about like the nice guy or whatever. Um who's too afraid to like go after what he wants and all that. And it's like, I've been doing better with that. You know, like I'm able to like, I kind of like stumble into positions uh, that I'm in. And so now like, you know, a lot of people see me as more driven <laughs> than I really am, <laughs> which is good. I like that, you know, it's cool, you know, but uh, it turns out that like, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm just not like as warrior as I could be. Um, but thankfully the magician, <laughs> helps a lot, like I've really related to that. Um, but yeah, so I saw us as like both like lover, I mean, both magician, king, and then um, warrior you more related to and you suppress lover. And then for me, it's like the opposite where I more related to lover and I suppress king. Um, but yeah, what did you see? Warrior, not king, you don't suppress king, you suppress oh, yeah. warrior. Yeah, suppress warrior, yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. keep it right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I definitely see you as the magician and the king. Um, and those two, I think, were very similar. Mm. Um, I do see more of the completeness of the lover archetype in you. Like, sort of like mind but not repressed. Mm. <laughs> um, you're the healthy version of me. Um, <laughs> the warrior archetype, I don't quite see it. Um, no, I don't see it. <laughs> it's, it's that simple. Um, the example you brought up would be Soul Losers from the basketball team with it. Uh, -huh. uh, I think that doesn't quite sound warrior to me. It more sounds hero. Uh -huh. Or maybe the, uh, shadow sadist. So gotcha. it's not quite the healthy warrior archetype. I see. Huh. Okay. What would warrior archetype look like with me? If you would develop it? Yeah, like if you were to like kind of predict how it would look like for me developing it more. I'd say more assertiveness in pushing the or not pushing like like i said destruction but destruction where it's supposed to be mm -hmm. um the sort of assertiveness in carrying out your ideas to a greater extent mm -hmm. mm. now i might be projecting this i'm like this but sort of not waiting for the idea to catch hold of itself but rather make the idea hmm. into reality interesting but tell me if i'm just creating that because that's a problem i have but it feels like it could be something oh no oh uh, well <laughs> the funny thing is i probably don't even know like i mean i'm right now i'm like analyzing it i'm like huh because that 
that does that didn't strike me as like wrong right away or anything. Um, so I'm just more seeing like, huh, does that like do I relate to that? And I feel like you're probably right. Like I just I just know that my assertiveness in certain areas like is not is not as good as it can be. Um, like online, it's better. I I think like I I do express like more of my opinions and everything like especially on my YouTube channel. But even then, like a lot of uh, people, <laughs> some people are telling me that like I guess they expect me to have like more of an Elliot Hulse type of presence where it's like I'm commanding things like on camera or whatever, and actually and rather than just like sitting in front and like just sharing thoughts passively. Um, but yeah, no, that, that, that could be right though, for sure. And as a masculine man or who's trying to develop all four of these archetypes, then that's good to uh, ponder on. Cause yeah, I wanted to know what you thought about that. I'd like for someone now I'm drawing from my own example of rugby again, but for someone wanting to develop the warrior archetype, I think some kind of sport is a good way to go. Cause that brings out the, I think for now we're going to analysis of the culture we have, but I think sport is the way of express the way of expressing the warrior that we have today. Mm. That sport is essentially a safe war. Gotcha. gotcha. So we went away from tribal wars where our village fought the next village, but now we do it in football instead. Mm. So it's the same archetypal meaning, but the outcome isn't a ton of dead people, which is good. Got you. Okay, cool. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Awesome. Well, uh, did you have any like last notes? Um, any uh, things that you wanted to just put out there and shout out uh, before we end the broadcast? I have a last note and a last question. Sure. Since your lover archetypes more developed, how would you like turning your question around to me? What what would I do to develop the lover archetype? Hmm. Okay. Um. Well, I think you. It's not as suppressed maybe as you'd think, because I feel like, especially as of like recently, I've been seeing. <laughs> you kind of like express a little bit more. Um, and uh, so I could see how whoever it was that said that it was obvious, I could see how they would say that. Um, especially just with knowing you. Like, I think that just in general, <laughs> you're you're never gonna be a expressive person. Like that's, that's just what, not. the reality. <laughs> but your way of expressiveness is, clear like you're not like you're not someone who is completely stoic stoic in the sense of like you know just like emotionless or anything um but you're someone who like yeah you're not like probably like laughing all the time and like high energy or whatever but you're also not the other extreme either like i would be able to hang out with you and i would not feel weird at all you know and i think that uh when you do show your expressiveness it comes in the form where your lover archetype comes out in the form of like you know when you're on twitter and you're you're talking about um your love for archetypes you know that could be like one thing <clears throat> like when when you talk about the goddesses and you talk about you know like persephone and you know just all of these other things and even in your sense of humor a lot of times like you might not put an lol in your tweet or something <laughs> but we we can see the types of jokes that you're you're putting there and all of that like shows that you, you see like a beauty in the world that many people aren't seeing um and you it it kind of like goes hand in hand with the magician like you're seeing all of this beauty in the world and then now you're taking it and you're using it like a magician would to like you know, teach and to do all of this, but you wouldn't have been able to do that if you weren't able to notice the beauty in the world. 
Um, so you don't seem like an actual stoic who is just like, I guess like, I don't know if the word is like nihilistic in a way where it's like, there's nothing to life. Like, I'm just, I'm just gonna die. You know, like carpe diem, like the warrior, like the warrior could become so fixated on just whatever that they're not really like enjoying the moment. They're in the moment because they have to be protective or whatever, but they're not really like seeing the beauty in the moment. And I feel like you do well with being able to see the beauty of the moment and capture the beauty of certain things, especially as a Christian, like, you know, like the things that God has created and being able to marvel at that and watching certain movies and getting insights from them. Like you, you pay more attention to the themes and the archetypes from that. Um, and I feel like that's all, in my opinion, you could correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's all expression of the lover archetype. And I think that's, that's coincidentally how I'd relate to that as well. So it's probably not as suppressed as you think. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Like, I think the way that I think it's more repressed or well, that I thought it's more repressed is that it's sort of expressed through the magician archetype, mm. in a sense, and not in the lover without the magician. So when I thought about the lover, I imagined this pure lover archetype, and not in the not in combination with the magician. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's make that makes a lot of sense, and. One addition, if I ever write a tweet and set LOL in it, that's when you know I'm kidnapped and screaming for help. <laughs> I could not see myself doing that otherwise. Okay. So if I ever tweet that, everyone is watching this, then I'm in need of help. I was actually about to tweet that right now. Like, <laughs> that's hilarious. But now we all know. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool. I'm really happy that we were able to do this, man. Um, we were supposed to do this actually last Monday, I believe. Yeah. But um, today worked very well also. Um, so for those of you who are watching um, post live stream, by then I should have um, all of Johannes' information in the comments and in the description. Um, I'm also going to include my notes in the description so that you guys can be able to follow along with that. I'm probably going to do some timestamps sometime this week when I get the chance, or you guys can go ahead and put the timestamps there for me if you're watching um, to help out other uh, subscribers and everything. But yeah, be sure to check Johannes out on Twitter and be sure to subscribe to his email, check out his blog, um, all of that. He's a really cool guy. And we also did another live stream together as well. Um, and I can provide that link, um, both the shorter version that I've cut up where he was talking about socionics versus MBTI. And then there's a whole full live stream that's on Facebook. Um, I'll try and include that link as well. But other than that, I think that's about all. Thanks so much for featuring on the uh, broadcast today, Johannes. I appreciate it. Thanks for letting on. It's hmm. really fun. Mm -hmm. As was the last one you did. Oh, sorry? As was the last one we did. I enjoyed this. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I'm glad. <laughs> All I right. You channel the magician archetype. Yes. It's fun. It's fun. This is what, it's what I do all the time on this channel. Um, I'm jealous. <laughs> but all right, y'all. Done.